There are a number of ways to install and manage software on a Linux computer. In this lecture, we'll take a look at the basics required to install software from source code onto your Linux machine. This is, really, this is a really detailed topic, and in this case, we're just going to touch on the fundamentals. Uh, and in this case, we won't really see things go wrong or have to troubleshoot errors. Um, but for the most part, you should be able to install packages from source uh, on standard um, Linux distributions. In this case, we'll use Ubuntu to take a look at how this works. So first off, let's talk a little bit about the different ways that you can manage software installations uh, on a Linux machine. In this lecture, we'll look at using source code that we'll download in a tar uh, gzipped file, and we'll actually go ahead and compile this uh, from source using a C or C++ compiler. Uh, and we will, uh, this, this is the really nice part about this is that the whole process is going to be automated for us utilizing uh, a utility on Linux called Make. So if you're not a programmer or you have minimal programming experience or you've never programmed in C, it's really nice because Make uh, gives you the ability to uh, compile and install the software, as you'll see in this lecture, uh, without really needing to know too much about the internals of how that code is put together. Most software on modern Linux, Linux distributions um, is installed and managed through package managers. And the most popular would be Red Hat Package Manager uh, and APT, the Advanced Packaging Tool. If you use BSD flavors of Linux, um, you may be using a utility called Ports. Um, I just said BSD flavors of Linux. I meant BSD flavors of Unix. You'll be uh, probably using a tool called Ports. Um, and uh, some Mac users might even be familiar with Mac Ports, since Mac uh, OS X is a version of BSD. Uh, but we won't talk about package managers. I have a separate lecture to talk about those. So I just wanted to kind of overview those options. So let's take a look at how we can um, start to manage components from source. I do need to mention one more thing about package managers. Um, if you do use package managers to install software, and the only thing you use to install software is a package manager, then a really nice feature of that is the package manager will uh, allow you to automatically update software, it will automatically install software, it will manage the process of removing software, uh, and it will track all of the software on your system. Uh, but when you start to install software using just the source code, as we will, uh, in this lecture, you're going to be uh, required to um, basically uh, keep track of where everything gets installed to, get, keep track of the version of the software you have installed, and basically if you want to remove it, you have to do so manually. So package managers kind of give you that ability that, say, the Add Remove Program control panel in, in Microsoft Windows gives you. When you install with Source, you don't get that. So we'll see how that works in this lecture, uh, and you'll see how we copy things over um, using the Make command to uh, get things where they need to be. And you'll see a little bit of the issues related to having to just kind of remember like what you've installed and where it went. So Make is a utility that allows for the um, automate automation of the compilation of programming source code for our system. And Make's really awesome because, again, uh, without it, uh, we would need to enter a bunch of command line um, uh, well, a bunch of commands on the command line to uh, get, take our code from source code and convert it into uh, the necessary machine code and link it against the appropriate libraries. Uh, and then finally, we would have to manually kind of put things where they're expected to be on our system. What's really great is that uh, Make uh, utilizes these things called Make Files, which basically define all of the necessary um, commands to compile a program and also can include directives on where to install programs uh, once they've been compiled. So make is um, the command that you should be interfacing with the most in terms of installing software. A, a good piece of software is going to come with a make file, uh, you know, a good, well sorry, a good, a good a zip file of source code from, from a, you know, um, a reputable project or a well, a well run project is going to come with a, a make file that's going to make things pretty easy. And if you're running a what I'll, what I'll call one of the bigger Linux distributions, so if you're using like Fedora or CentOS or um, you know any of the Red Hat derivatives or uh, Ubuntu or Debian, like some of the bigger names, you should really have no problem because those make files would be well targeted for those systems. Uh, one thing to point out though is that make files uh, can have errors in them or it can be far from perfect and really you know it really isn't necessarily an error on the part of the person who built them uh, it could just be that they make an assumption about your system based upon a specific version and then you have either an older version or a newer version and so sometimes there is a requirement to edit make files that goes beyond the scope of this lecture though and we're gonna uh, should errors arise uh, during the compilation process um, we could talk about that but I'm pretty sure that the uh, component we're going to install today will uh, will work pretty well. So the other thing that's important to note 
like a package manager will keep a central database of what you have installed, the version, where things went, what files are included. Um, with a make file, you need to do that yourself uh, when you're installing from source. So that's pretty important. And I usually say that um, for somebody that r administers a Unix system, uh, you, you really do have the capability to know every file in the system, what it does, what purpose it serves. Uh, and, I, and I think that's you know not a, a strange statement to make, whereas I feel like uh, on a Windows system, there's a lot of files, say, in the system directories that you really just don't know what they are. Uh, I really feel like after some experience and time on a Unix system, uh, as you get used to customizing the system, you can get to the point where you know why everything is on your system and specifically what it does and what uses that component on your system. So, um, you know, one thing with Make is that it does kind of force you to dig in and really know what's on your system uh, to keep track of what's there. Uh, and we're going to actually notice, the last thing we'll talk about is that when we compile with Make, we can also use the Make file to... Um, install the application for us. In other words, just kind of copy it where it needs to go. And some make files will actually support uh, uninstallation, um, which is kind of nice as well. We kind of unwind what uh, you've done. So uh, sometimes it's worth keeping the source code and the make file around so you can have that capability. Again, you'll need to look at the readme file associated with your um, program and the documentation that you, you that comes with the, the components to download to make sure that you have uh, everything available to, uh, or, or that the make file actually supports that feature. When we run make, we're going to be usually running three basic commands. Um, although, with that said, it's always important to check the readme file in all capital letters that should be distributed. It's kind of a convention. Uh, you should always see some type of readme first or documentation or, or um, installation file that explains the process necessary uh, for installing the program you're installing, and it may include information specifically about what files are going to get installed where. All of your uh, source code will be distributed as um, uh, you know tar archives that will be zipped, either with gzip or bzip2. And so we'll just download those. We'll unpack the file, and then we'll go ahead and look for instructions to install. Again, the process is going to follow this three-step process. You're going to see uh, us run the configure command, which is a local script inside of your uh, directory of source code that you've downloaded. And what that does is it kind of goes out and probes the system to find out information about what compiler you have, whether or not you have the appropriate components installed uh, to, to perform the installation. Uh, next up, you're going to run make, and this will actually do the compilation of the program, so convert it from source code into machine code. And then finally, make install, which you will run. Uh, and to actually run make install, you'll need elevated privileges. So usually you'll run sudo make install. And what that'll do is just go ahead and copy the binary file into the appropriate place on the system so that it can be found within your path and can be installed. So let's actually install something, and uh, we're going to use Ubuntu for this example. So um, if you're using a different distribution, things should pretty much work the same. So let's see how this goes. The program I'm going to install today is MPG123. It's a command line MP3 player, so you can actually play MP3 files from the command line. Uh, it can be pretty helpful. And kind of a classic program, and one that's not installed on Ubuntu by default, and one that compiles fairly quickly, uh, and one that gives us um, some interesting things to talk about. So you notice that my MPG123 um, uh, file is a tarred bzip2 file. So I'm going to go ahead first, and I'm going to uh, uncompress it. And I'll do this in two steps just to make it more clear that I'm actually uncompressing the file first. And if I run ls, you'll notice now I can untar it. And remember, you can, um, uh, when, if something's already compressed, you can actually go ahead and uncompress it at the same time you untar it. But in this case, we'll just do it in two steps so we can emphasize the fact that we're uncompressing and untarring the file. So I'm going to extract this. I like the V for verbosity. I like to see what's going on. Uh, and then the file that I want to uncompress, or sorry, untar. And you'll see that a number of items, if I scroll back up here, uh, get uncompressed. So there's a lot of stuff. And you'll notice that there's a lot of .c files, a lot of .h files, uh, .s files. I'm going to guess those are uh, assembly files. I could be wrong about that. And it's been a while since my, my C is pretty rusty at this point. Uh, I've done a lot of Objective-C coding, but my pure C coding is a little rusty. Uh, anyway, so you can see a lot of things were actually um, untarred from that archive. So what I'm going to do is go into the new folder that was created and take a look around. And you'll notice that there's a number of items in this directory. 
Uh, and the first thing you usually want to do is look for a folder, or sorry, look for a file called something like uh, README or install. Well, here you'll notice that there's a file called install, but over here you'll notice that there's a file called README. And usually what you want to do is read those files to get an idea uh, of what uh, you need to do to make this work. I'll also mention there's also this file in here called configure, which is going to be the first step that we talked about in building this. But first let's go through here and take a look at the README file. So if I go through this README file, you'll notice that it, um, it uses the long line wrap, so I think we can see most of what's important. Uh, and so if I scroll down, uh, it gives me some in information about the project, about the program, it tells me how to use the program, um, and you'll notice that if I go through here, I'm still looking, I may have already missed it, it gives me information about the program itself. Um, and if I keep going down here, it talks about history of the project. I think I missed, let's go back up to the beginning, the part about actually installing it. So again, you might have this issue as well, right? Um, so introduction, oh, this is me, I'm being too quick. Notice that it says, um, depending on your platform, basically if we read through the instructions, it says see the install file for how to install this. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to look at the install file. And it's basically going to tell me what I need. I need a C compiler. Um, and I obviously need a Linux-like or Unix-like operating system. And what you're going to notice is as I scroll down here, uh, it's going to give me some information about how to build it build the program. And what you'll notice is that it actually tells me to go through the process that dis I discussed previously in the slides, that we need to configure it, we need to make it, and we need to run make install. So let's try to run that and see how things work. Uh, for the most part, your Linux installation should have everything it needs to go about uh, compiling this program. If it doesn't, we can actually go ahead and I'll show you on Ubuntu how to install what's necessary. But for the most part, let's just try and go for it. I need to run the configure script. Configure script is in my current directory. My current directory is not in my path, nor should it be. So I'm going to run dot .configure to indicate that I want to run that program. And when I run configure, it's going to go ahead and probe my system and collect information about what's available. So things like what C compilers I have, what libraries are available, uh, system architecture, uh, like 32, 64-bit, uh, all types of information. And from that point, it just kind of gathers some uh, information so that it can properly run the compilation process. And at the end, you'll notice that it tells me if everything runs successfully, it tells me that I should run make and then make install. So let's go ahead and uh, run make. And what make's going to do is, it's going to take all that information that was just uh, aggregated through the configure process, and it's going to use it to actually take the source code and compile uh, a program for me. Uh, this can take a while, depending on your, your CPU architecture and what you're compiling, uh, and your CPU speed. Not so much the architecture, but the speed. Uh, I remember years ago, my first Linux machine was a 486, and whenever I would compile the Linux kernel, that could take up to uh, 12 hours. I'd often hit compile, go to bed, and wake up, and it would be almost done. So in this case, uh, things go pretty quick. And it tells me that uh, it's gone ahead and compiled it. I didn't see anything that said error. How would you know that there was a problem? You would see uh, a big error message that compilation exited due to error. But in this case, I didn't have any errors on my system, so uh, everything worked out well. And finally, the last thing I need to run is make install. So first thing I'm going to do is run make install uh, as a regular user so you can see the errors that it, it gives me. So notice I was able to compile everything and I was able to, uh, I was able to do all the initial like, configuration work in my home directory. But now what's going to happen is uh, when I run make install, this is going to want to copy this into uh, one of the, a, a couple of system directories that I don't have permission to enter. So I'm going to go ahead and do sudo make install, which will let me run this as root. And it makes sense that that would be how this works. And once I run that as sudo, you will notice that it tells me and shows me uh, that uh, everything is in the correct spot. And now that this is installed, we can test it in a few ways, right? Oops, not clar, but clear. And what I can do is if I run which mpg123, you'll notice that it's now installed. And if I try to run mpg123, there's a little error that's going to occur. Um, one of the things that happened with this program is in addition to installing the program itself, it's installed a shared library. So I actually need to go ahead and uh, run a program called ldconfig to make sure that 
everything is fixed. And I had to run that as super user too, sorry. Notice it kind of hung. Um, and I ran sudo ld config. And what that will do now is kind of fix this error. And now if I try to run mpg123, uh, I get information about how to use the program. And if I had an mp3 on my system, I would be able to go ahead and I would be able to run it and play it and listen to it through my speakers if the audio subsystem was set up correctly. What does ldconfig do? Basically, it just configures dynamic linking of um, shared libraries at runtime. So in the case of MPG123, I had installed the program and uh, it installed a new shared library and I basically just had to tell the system that that new library was there uh, and that it's okay to use it. So uh, ldconfig in this case uh, was necessary because it was just a way to let the system know